This is the Jeff Orovitz Show on 97.1 The Big Talker. All right, more on this school that called out the unvaccinated 7th graders plus Congressman Paul Gosar and Senate candidate Jim Lehman. The Jeff Orovitz Show starts now. All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for listening. Jeff Orvitz here. Happy to be here with you today. And if you got a comment, we'd love to hear from you. Send an email. Just Wireless sponsors our email. Send those in and we get to those as, as much as possible. Talk with Jeff at iCloud.com. A lot to get to. We'll update you on this seventh, the seventh graders that were called out. The, the, the principal went around the class because some teacher got or somebody got COVID and they freaked out and asked them their vac- vaccination status in front of everyone. Got an interview with one of the moms coming up, so stick around. That one's a crazy story right there. Uh, plus, uh, Congressman Paul Gosar. And uh, let's get right to it, though, with candidate for U.S. Senate, uh, Jim Lehman, returning to the program. Hey, Jim, how you doing today? Yeah, fantastic on this uh, beautiful Arizona day. Yeah, no shortage of uh, issues, right? Uh, it's uh, you, you, Campaign's going crazy. You guys are out there. You're running for Senate. There's quite a few people uh, pushing for that position right now. We'll get into that race here in just a few minutes. Um, let me get your take, though, first to start off with the Supreme Court ruling. I know when you were on, I think you were back on in on November 4th, uh, and folks, it's show number 1232. Jim and I spent a whole hour together. If you want to get real in-depth, look that up at talkwithjeff.com. But, Jim, I know you're a businessman. And when you see the Supreme Court rule, you got a you know hundred or more employees. They they made this mandate where you have to have them either shot up or um, or, or masked and tested. But they the Supreme Court kind of took their time, and, and and businesses had to implement this this past week, and it, now it's gone. Your reaction to the Supreme Court the ruling? A little positive side, Jeff. Uh, a win for you know America first and for freedom in our country. It's um, I think uh, one of many that are coming, America is really pushing back on this hard left march this march in our country. uh, I see it every day on the campaign. People are rising up. Uh, We've got a Supreme Court. You know, the President Trump has moved in the direction of America first. And I think uh, from a citizen standpoint, you're going to see more wins of people moving into office that I just have never thought about politics before, like myself and taking this country back in the right direction. Yeah, I was just a little surprised the Supreme Court, they're on kind of like their own bubble time. You know, I'm glad they ruled, don't get me wrong, but it's just like, what, 80 million employees, employers and employees were affected, you know, while they were waiting. But I guess you know that, you've been in business forever, and it's like you're always, they're on a different world, uh, different world clock than we are, I guess. Most government. I would say uh, essentially all, uh, yeah. Jeff. Very true. Uh, my business, uh, you know, just sold it recently to focus the Supreme, uh, excuse me, to uh, focus on this race full time. Yeah. Uh, billion dollar business we created uh, here in Arizona over the last eight years. 1,750 staff members, uh, 22% were veterans. And I can assure you, in our company, we're Freedom First. Uh, and we had a challenge from our insurance company it said, uh, you know, what's your vaccination policy? We told them Freedom First. Uh, the staff, uh, we, we encourage them to do what they feel is right for their family. And, insurance company gets a little pushed back we said well you come along with us or we'll find a new insurance company yeah (laughs) same thing with government supreme court Uh, they have no idea what it's like in the real world to compete and win uh, every day you know against china the rest of the world but we're going to be making those changes as i get to the uh, u.s senate going to be a beacon of hope and just tenacity and guts up there to get back to America first. It's going to take a lot. And let me ask you this, because I know your business, um, you were in solar and you've had other businesses as as well, I believe. Uh, Let's talk energy policy, because it seems like things that are faltering by design here. And, you know, let's push just all solar. And I'm talking to a guy that did solar here. Uh, So maybe you can explain to us once again, and then maybe to maybe your future colleagues in in Congress and in the Senate, base load versus peak load. Can you, can you break that down for us? What, what those two are? Happy to do that, Jeff. Uh, first, and I don't say this arrogantly, I've been in the industry uh, for you know, 30 years. I came from building large scale, you know, supercritical coal plants, uh, combined cycle gas plants, and then uh, large scale, uh, high efficiency uh, solar. Now, I am very pro all of the above policy. Uh, even met with President Trump uh, a couple of times in the last two months, and 
as I told him, you know, you got it started with energy independence, you know, Biden and those clowns uh, on the environmental wacko side that they've just gone way too far have moved us uh, into, again, begging for energy from Russia, from uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, no absolute zero need for that uh, in this in this country. The base load and uh, peak load uh, situation is one that uh, you look at from a base load, uh, that's evening hours, the grid um, doesn't go to sleep, but uh, as America is resting, uh, so is the grid. It's uh, low-level power. At peak of the day, people are working, factories are running, people are you know in the offices running air conditioners, things of that nature. The power load goes up quite a bit. Uh, solar, utility solar, is designed specifically uh, for that. That is the high cost of the day because a plant only runs for a certain number of hours a day to add to that peak from the base load. Solar, uh, again, the, the team I built and others around the country, we had driven down the cost of utility scale, large scale stuff. I'm talking, you know, typically 300 megawatts, which would power, say, uh, you know, the, half the city of Scottsdale in a typical plant. Now, those are uh, peaking power, and the we've driven the cost down. Peaking power used to be in the 15 to 25 cent range. Today, utility scale solar is two and a half cents. Wow. But really brought the cost down. Gas, for example, gas fired uh, power is about five cents. Then you go to coal at 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Nuclear is about 23. And those are numbers that are not issued, uh, you know, by uh, lobbyists or things like that. Uh, those are the DOE, Department of Energy Records, that are public uh, knowledge out there. So the beauty of having all of the above, we got bountiful. Hundreds and hundreds of years of beautiful, clean, gla- uh, clean uh, natural gas supplies. We should be using that. We uh, use all the great two and a half cent uh, kilowatt hour uh, solar uh, that we can build. Supplement uh, natural gas. And is that storage, your, by the way? Sorry to oh, interrupt no. you, but is that um, Jim? And we're talking with Jim Lehman, who's running for U.S. Senate. Is that the solar would be your peak then? Because obviously the sun exactly. shines during the day. <laughs> last I checked, it's, and people are like you said, using everything more during the day. They're at work, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, a good thing. That's what we should be striving for. Is 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 a, things like solar? But then your base load would be what your nuclear, and what else yeah. is considered base load? Yeah, nuclear, we're transitioning quickly to uh, natural gas, again, okay. just given the bountiful supply and the low cost of it. Uh, so when APS and others say, oh, we need a rate increase, uh, we need to say BS to that because the cost of generation today is down, and it's down big, uh, Jeff, uh, particularly in the areas of the Southwest with you know bountiful uh, sunshine. Yeah. But we're building competitively in Maine, Oregon, <laughs> you name it. Uh, we're out there uh, beating the pants off of, Others, so you're absolutely right. Uh, one additional supply can, item coming on screen is storage. So you uh, during that peak, any power not being used uh, by the grid consumed, you store it in batteries and then release it uh, in the evening hours. So that that window of solar plus storage is, you know, from early morning uh, to uh, late afternoon, uh, even even into early evening. And then, as you said, you move over into base load. Now there are still. Uh, nuclear and coal plants that are online in a country. Uh, none is no. There's only been two nuclear plants uh, built since Three Mile Island, uh, which you may oh, be uh, yeah. too young to even know about. But late, again, it's late seven, is that late seventies? Late seventies, yeah, and uh, those two just came online. Unfortunately, they were programmed uh, to be about seven billion. They came in at about thirty. <laughs> well, isn't that just about right, right? Uh, <laughs> inflation. We'll blame it on the inflation, right? Um, there you go. Let, let me ask you, Jim, because um, when you mentioned storage batteries and things like that, I want to switch gears here to China and um, a big issue there with China. Obviously, if we go to more batteries and things like that, a lot of these materials are come from China. But China and what we've learned during the, the past two years is supply chain issues. I'm sure you had to deal with that a lot being in solar because I think most of those panels are now being produced over there. How do we fix this imbalance going forward? I, I, I kind of get the sense right. and I hear more and more that China's turning internal and they're, they're saying, hey, we want to keep this for an internal market. We have 1.2 billion or whatever. Uh, so maybe you don't get that over there in the U.S. H- how do we fix this imbalance we've got? Not only with the, the goods and services, but the debt too. Uh, Jeff, great question. And I intend to be uh, all over this uh, on energy and our 
in the U.S. Senate because it's such a uh, a great commodity that can help us bring manufacturing back to this country and great jobs that go with it and bring down the cost of electricity, just like it'd be a, a rate cut, you know, everybody's electrical bill. Uh, if we implement, uh, you know, reasonable policies and get the government the hell out of it. So the goal here is that um, from a, from a uh, renewable standpoint, uh, talk about batteries uh, first. Uh, the lithium side of the equation is, is where the, the focus uh, is at today. And that is the factories and the supply chain of uh, the lithium for those batteries. Now, we actually have a bountiful supply in this country. And in fact, there are 25 battery factories uh, that are either coming online this year or begin construction this year. And they say, okay, we want those raw materials. Jeff, we're blessed with those, even as close to us as the salt and sea, you know, on our, literally on our border nearly with uh, California. Mm -hmm. um, companies that I've been working with uh, from a mining standpoint to help understand that better, we have the ability in America for our own lithium, uh, both mining uh, as well as uh, the manufacturing is already underway. That's already being built. So I intend to be very pro-mining because if you look at it, uh, as environmentalists would say, you know, this is one globe. The atmosphere moves around the globe because we all you know, know that's pretty fair logic. To make that in China, it is at least two and a half times as dirty from an emission standpoint as anything we do in the United States because we've got good, strong environmental laws. And we got to get the EPA, Forest Service, the hell out of the way because we know what the laws are. Let's live by the laws. We can build plants that meet those emissions, but we've got the supply. Those are great jobs. And from lithium to copper, uranium, you name it, Jeff. Mm -hmm. We need to get back to that yeah, policy. Bring the jobs it's back. a national security issue, too, that we've learned the past two years. I, I will say this. Um, you will get um, flack from the people that show up to complain in, in D.C. or whatever. They're writing to you on their, their laptops and their other lithium battery-enabled devices telling <laughs> you not to mine, not to get the lithium. That's the hypocrisy that we kind of deal with uh, in, in this society. So I, 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 you're right. And it, we're, all we're doing is offshoring this stuff to another country, another part of the world. Let me let me ask you this, uh, Jim. Let's switch to uh, immigration issues. Have you had a chance to talk to any of the, the border mayors? I, I haven't had an opportunity to get on. Um, um, I've had Sheriff Lamb on before, but I haven't had the opportunity to get like the mayor of Yuma on. And you know, he's been ringing the alarm bell as far as, you know, just being overrun with people coming in. What, what are you hearing out there? What's it like on the ground? Have you experienced it? Talk, talk about that a bit. Jeff, I'm blessed to have the endorsement of the National Border Patrol Council, all 21,000 members who are bringing 1,000 volunteers to our campaign. Uh, Brandon Judd, uh, who is active president for them, is endorsed and is on the campaign trail with us. Tom Holman, Mark Morgan, uh, and just yesterday, Chad Wolf have all endorsed. Brandon called last week and said, Jim, you've got to come down here and see this. Went down to Yuma. And what we saw, uh, Jeff, is shocking. Uh, the numbers, by the way, in the macro, uh, 1.9 million uh, were announced uh, by uh, DHS as having crossed the border. No one's arrested. They're all processed and moved quickly into the heartland. As Brandon said, at least 400,000 never saw a border patrol agent. So 2.3 million. Jeff, for your listeners in perspective, that's a baseball stadium every week. That's 42,000 people. So we went to Yuma. And Brandon, uh, he said, you know, come in about 10 a.m. We did. Well, what occurred uh, during the morning is he said, uh, because I want you to observe this, is that uh, Ubekistan had chartered many charter planes, flew into Mexico City, the Soros and team bust them up to Mexicali. Then they crossed across the border early in the morning. They sit and wait to be picked up by immigration and processed. All of those border agents were back processing all morning when we were there at the border at 10 a.m., the only Border Patrol agent on the border was Brandon Judd, me standing there with him. You can watch then groups of 8, 10, and 12 are crossing without ever seeing a border agent. They walk straight into town. We watch them go. They get in black suburbans, and off they go, military-age males. Jeff, this is beyond a crisis. This is an invasion. Yeah of our country, we are absolutely overrun and there are untold dangers coming through. This is not a humanitarian crisis, Jeff. This is an invasion. And, and I intend to do everything. 
Jim, right. you're saying the same thing that others are saying that have been down there. Congressman Gosar, Congressman Biggs, uh, everyone I talked to, I, I've had Tom Homan on the show before as well, former uh, acting director of ICE, right? And, and he said he's never seen it this bad. Never. It, it's beyond anything you can comprehend. I mean, you see old stock footage on TV of caravans. Guys, this is way more organized now. These are charter planes coming into Mexico City and buses taking them to the border. They simply walk to the border, hold their hands up, they get processed and sent. I mean, there's even processing centers on the other side of the border where they're getting, you know, backpacks and things so that they even are faster to be processed when they get into the border agents. So they get signed up for all kind of nice little benefits that we taxpayers are paying for. Yeah into the countryside and the heartland to go to compete with our tax paying citizens who are paying the cost a and b that are being driven down in wages for american workers it's absolutely on purpose and it's an invasion and jeff number one priority for me in the u.s senate stop all business whatever i can do jeff to protect america from this onslaught from around the world i will do in the u.s senate Let's uh, end with this, Jim. And we're talking with Jim Lehman, who's running for uh, Senate here in Arizona, U.S. Senate. Uh, obviously, well, this didn't really affect you, obviously, but the, the districts are all set. And we may be on a course to where we have more members of, of the House, more members in Congress who uh, are, are Republican than Democrats. We have two U.S. senators right now that both Democrats in Arizona. It's very surprising. I've never seen Mark Kelly, never had him on the show, uh, you know, I, 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 we've tried. It's just, it's just not going to happen, folks. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, that's this race is so important because I think a lot of people feel that they haven't seen him, and he's been way off base. I mean, once in a while, cinema will stand up and, and at least hold up on the filibuster, things like that. Uh, but Kelly is just—he's going right along with the the Build Back Better, the the voting, uh, changing our voting laws, nationalizing our elections. Uh, are you hopeful? I mean, are you hopeful that we're going to change? We're going to go Republican here in the States and, and talk about the race in general and you're, you're, what you're seeing out there, what you're hearing? Jeff, I'm certain we're going to win. Mark Kelly ran as a moderate. He lied. He knows he lied. He is, you know, funded by George Soros and other groups like that on the far left. He's voting 100% in lockstep with whatever the far left. He's the AOC of the Senate. And the votes, the, the, the people are going to see that in the ads that we're posting, uh, how radical his votes are. Uh, Mark's gone off the rails, and he's got to go. Uh, I have, as I said earlier, sold the company that we built here in Arizona. I'm putting in a small fortune, my own money. I'm not going to take a salary or a pension. I'm not taking lobbyist dollars or PAC dollars. Our funding is coming from all over the state thousands of small dollar donations as well as across the country. So we're going to put in the resources that uh, it takes to win this. It is that important, you know, for our country because we know how close the Senate is. The only competitive races in the country are a number one ground central is Arizona, then second, um, Georgia, and then third in Nevada. So we must win and we will win in Arizona. All right. I, I, I hope that's the case because we can't keep going on like this uh, anymore. So, Jim, uh, keep it up, and I appreciate you spending the time with us again. Uh, and, and, folks, remember, if uh, we'll get this interview posted. I'll put a link to your website, Jim, and also we've got the interview from November 4th, number show number 1232. We'll get that out there, and we'll look forward to having you uh, here uh, on the show more as, as time goes on and we get deeper, d closer to August, closer to August, Jim. Oh. Appreciate it. Thank you, brother, and uh, keep up the great work. All right, thank you, and we'll talk with you soon. All right, folks, a lot more to come, including Congressman Paul Gosar. Plus, we'll talk about this big education issue uh, and these, these uh, kids that were being called out in their class for being unvaccinated. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. Back in a few. Sponsor this segment of the show is Nova Home Loans, and with inflation running at, running at its fastest pace in nearly 40 years, most Fed officials now see it, at least three rate hike increases coming up. 
Uh, now's the time to make headway on paying off your high rate credit cards and consolidate other revolving debt by refinancing your mortgage. Whether you have perfect credit or not so perfect credit, you need to call Kim Dawson at Nova Home Loans. Kim knows how to find the program that works specifically for you. And since Nova is both a bank and a broker, she has the flexibility to shop for the best rates and terms. Call Kim for a purchase or for a refinance before the Fed starts raising rates at 928 310-6458. That's 928-310-6458. Kim will even waive the lender fees and all VA loans. Call 928-310-6458. Kim Dawson at Nova Home Loans, the girl who gets it done. 928-310-6458. Nova Home Loans, NMLS 3087. Terms and conditions may apply. BK number 0902429, an equal housing opportunity. Hang tight. Back in just a few minutes. All right, President uh, Biden's approval ratings are in the absolute gutter here. Uh, I want to start with that, this segment. Uh, Quinnip- Quinnipiac, I never know how to pronounce that, university poll, Biden job approvals. Americans give President Joe Biden a negative uh, 33 to 53 uh, per- uh, per- percent job approval rating, while 13% did not offer an opinion. So he's got like a 33% approval rating. It's great. Uh, in November 2020. 2020- 21, it was like 36. So he's gone down. Uh, the number is going down, actually, is because uh, no re- Republicans are supporting him. Uh, Democrats now say 75% approve. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know what's going on there. I mean, how can you approve? This guy's had absolute failure after failure. Uh, I told you earlier in the week I had several folks that used to be that I know, and even family members that were hardcore Biden supporters and just hated Trump so much. And now they're saying, I think I made a mistake. You think, can we go back in time? Can we uh, get in a DeLorean and, and, and try to fix that one? I don't know. Anyway, your thoughts, uh, Biden's approval ratings, can they get any lower? I don't know. Can you get down to 25% or so? Will there still be, uh, people holding on? Send me an email. Talk with Jeff at iCloud.com. Talk with Jeff at iCloud.com couple of uh, great sponsors here this segment. Um, First of all, my good friends at Timberline Firearms and Training. And uh, Rob Wilson was on the program here just on Wednesday. He'll be back again in a week or two. He will actually be part of the interview that's coming up next regarding this school issue. And the seventh graders being called out in school at Northern Preparatory Academy during during the class as to their vaccination status by the principal and the teacher. We got the parent and and the this, this seventh grade student coming up as well. Olivia will join me for that one as well. Uh, Timberline Firearms and Training, though, they have some great training opportunities available that you should definitely take advantage of. Uh, get out there and get training, whether you're new to firearms, they've got their first shots program, uh, intermediate handgun training, all the way up to expert levels. You need to go to Timberline Firearms and Training, just about five minutes north of the Flagstaff Mall. Super easy to find, super easy to get to, or just give them a call right now, or in a few minutes, at 928-526-7900. 928-526-7900. Ask about their training opportunities. Take advantage of that. Plus, sign up for their next free Stop the Bleed class. Very, they do it once a month. It, you could save a life with that. Please sign up for that. 928-526-7900. Or stop on by their shooting range, indoor shooting range, and, and plus they've got um, firearms, accessories, Liberty Safes, all of that out there at Timberline Firearms and Training, just five minutes north of the Flagstaff Mall. Our other great sponsor, another great northern Arizona company that employs a lot of people uh, here in the Flagstaff area, Home Co. Lumber and Hardware. And uh, they've got those employees because you go in there, you can tell, you can go into different departments. There's somebody there to help you with all your projects. And that's very rare nowadays. Plus, uh, super convenient. Uh, they've, you, you can order online uh, easily for same-day free in-town delivery. You just got to go to myhomeco.com. That's myhomeco.com. Homeco is spelled H-O-M-C-O. H-O-M-C-O, myhomeco.com, and I'm getting ready for some big projects coming up. Got a few uh, big uh, rough cut 
six by six beams I just picked up at home coat just the other day. So they've got all of that stuff in there and they'll be able to help you out. And plus, if you don't want to go over there, if you, you can go to drive in lumber yard, of course, or you can uh, just order from my home All right. Hey, send me an email. You got a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Talk with Jeff at iCloud.com. Talk with Jeff at iCloud.com. Uh, get those in. We're going to come back with this issue of the seventh graders being called out at this uh, Northland Preparatory Academy. It's a, it's a local Northern Arizona Flagstaff area charter school uh, being called out as to their vaccine status during the class. Uh, so stick around for that. Plus, I'll be looking for your comments. Hang tight. Back in just a minute. Right, a big issue we covered, we're going to recover here in, in just a second. Rachel and Micah joined us uh, both. Uh, well, Micah's a, a student at Northern Preparatory Academy, seventh grade, and his mom, Rachel, joined me and Rob Wilson and Olivia earlier in the week. Uh, this story just drives me nuts. It's uh, calling out people's vaccination status in the middle of the class. So we'll, we'll give you all the details. I think this one is well worth uh, another listen. Sponsor, this segment of the show's Gutter Helmet of Northern Arizona. And Gutter Helmet's the number one gutter protection company in the world. But Gutter Helmet's not just a screen. It's a multi-patented reverse curve that deflects pine needles and debris with a lifetime warranty and over 40 years of experience. If you don't want to clean those gutters, you don't want to go up on that roof, you don't, you don't want to get all that gunk out of there, then you need to call or text Carl the Gutter Helmet Man at 928-318-6555. Never clean your gutters again. In fact, the manufacturer offers a triple lifetime warranty. And don't forget to ask for their senior military and first responder discounts. Don't wait though. If you call or text right now, mention you heard it here on the show, save up to 30%. Call or text Carl the Gutter Helmet Man at 928-318-6555. That's 928-318-6555. 928-318-6555. Or go to gutterhelmets N-A-Z dot com. All right, like I said, we caught up with uh, Rachel and the, the mother of, of, of Micah, who uh, was going to NPA, seventh grade. And, you know, we've had plenty of experience with <laughs> NPA uh, here on the show and in, in my personal life. Uh, and, and this one just blows my mind. It's being called out in the middle of class regarding vaccination status. Uh, and, and joining me in this interview was Rob Wilson of Timberline Firearms and Training, as well as Olivia with several questions because she has a lot of experience uh, with this particular school. Here we go. Uh, so we've been talking about this NPA issue, Northland Preparatory Academy, this charter school, which I think you're all familiar with with uh, at this point uh olivia's is shared with you everybody's familiar with this thing i mean it's a disaster it's it's a disaster it a really well is a well-known disaster yeah, I mean, it, it is but let's uh, we, we've got uh, rachel on the line and and her son uh micah who is uh a, a seventh grader over at northland preparatory academy and uh olivia used to be in school with with micah and uh, over there at npa and apparently, as we said earlier, a, a bunch of kids were sent home Monday because of, of COVID. And, and Rachel, hey, welcome to the program. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you. Good. Thanks for taking the time. And, and we spoke earlier, and uh, I was just kind of surprised at how this all went down. It seems like from what I'm gathering from the chatter and from what you were saying is that Perhaps somebody came down with COVID, a teacher maybe, we're not exactly sure, and tested positive, and those results came in like the middle of the day or in the morning on Monday, and then it kind of all just kind of went, hit, <laughs> hit, hit the wall from there. Why, why don't you kind of recount what, what happened? Of course. Um, so Monday this week, uh, we dropped our son off at normal you know, time. Class is supposed to start at 8 a.m., and um, we had had no communication with the school over the weekend saying there was a potential of, you know, exposure or anything like that. So I dropped him off. And, and um, my first notification that something was wrong was at 8.13. Um, we got an email from the school saying there was a potential that there was an exposure. And all unvaccinated kids were being sent home in seventh grade. 
Um, so we immediately started texting our son to see what was going on. Um, and so he was in school and at that time and in his homeroom and they came, the principal came in to the room and said all kids who haven't been vaccinated are going to be sent home. And then they later changed it to not just vaccinated, uh, but with a booster. So only the kids who had had three vaccination shots were allowed to stay in the room. And to figure that out, instead of calling parents or, you know, doing it in a more proper way, the teacher went around to the students individually in front of everyone, asking them if they had been vaccinated and when the date of their last booster or shot had been. So if you answered no, you were immediately escorted out of the room to the gym to wait for your parents. Um, uh, there were several students who chose not to answer that question. Um, and so when those students chose not to answer, then they got also escorted out of the classroom to the gym. Um, but they did this right in front of everyone. And by the end, uh, my understanding, according to my son, is that there were only two students left in the class. So uh, it right. sounds like this, Rachel, would have been a, a gross violation of HIPAA laws to ask people personal medical questions in an open public setting like that. Would you agree? Especially with the fact that there was no parent present. I don't, I'm not, you know, an expert on the law, but I would think typically with health concerns, there needs to be a parent present or a signed sure. signature saying, you know, that they can do that type of thing. Well, how many seventh graders are going to know for sure when they were vaccinated? Well, yeah, that's so what I was when, thinking too. Is, you know, and yeah. remember that date yeah. or time or whatever. I, I don't even remember phone numbers anymore, <laughs> you know. Um, and Rachel's with <laughs> us and her son, uh, Mike, is seventh grader over at NPA and, and experienced this here just on, on Monday. So let me just rewind here for a second, Rachel. Um, the principal or, or and or the teacher was ba was going around the room. So I don't know how many kids are in the class. Approximately, Mike is with us as well, and I appreciate yeah, you. Let's yeah, how, how, how many kids were in in the class? About twenty. About twenty. Okay, so the principal was going around. Olivia, I think you have a, a follow up to this because you you and I were talking about this. How yeah, like being there. What was the situation like, and how did you and other students feel at the time? Well, a lot of, um, I'm assuming that people were like mostly scared and like, especially, uh, like, especially the kids who like were going to stay there if like they're going to spend the rest of the day in a class with only two kids. I'm assuming they were like confused and mm. would rather be somewhere else. Well, were, uh, did a lot of kids as the teacher or principal, was it the teacher going around asking this? So first the principal came in and he said that this isn't our policy, but, you know, we're kind of being forced to do this. They're not. Um, and then the teacher eventually asked us, like, when did we get our second vaccine? Which, yeah, a lot of kids just didn't answer. Didn't the answer. Question. Okay, so by not answering... You were you're, the presumption was you aren't vaccinated. Guilty. You're you're guilty. You're sent to the what were you sent to the gymnasium, Micah? The the gym? Yeah, we were sent to like the gym. Okay, waiting for our parents to come and pick us up. Okay, so you're all kind of like, was it okay when they came to you? Uh, and and Rachel, if you want to share this or not, I want to. I mean, when they came to Micah, you said what and what happened at from that point? And either one of you chime in on this. Uh we had decided, you know, months ago that that wasn't something we wanted Micah to be responsible for answering. And so uh, we had instructed him, you know, at the start of the school year to just not answer that question and refer them to, you know, us as parents. Good job. Um, so he, um, he's, his <laughs> alphabetically, he's toward the end of the alphabet. So they, I was um, the last one. Yeah. So mm. he was toward the end. And by the point they got to him, several students by that point had already, shrugged off the answer and not said anything. So he wasn't by any means the only kid in there who had been probably told the same thing. And Rachel, so have they given you any more information after this as to what prompted the decision and the, and the, and the behavior they chose there? Knowing that, you know, just because you're vaccinated doesn't mean you can't get and give <laughs> COVID. Um, so exactly. what, what drove their motive? What, what motivated them for this? Um, 
it sounds, I mean, from what they've communicated with us, they really haven't said much of anything. They wow. just, um, individual teachers have contacted us and told us, you know, if your kid's sick, don't worry about the homework. If they aren't sick, then they need to, you know, continue doing homework, uh, you know, via their, you know, different portals and things like that. Um, but they really haven't communicated on why that unfolded the way it did and how abrupt it was. We were told in the original email at 8.13 on Monday that they did not want any of the kids who had been exposed returning this entire week um, unless they had a, um, well, not even unless, they wanted them to get a, a COVID testing done, um, I think on Thursday or Friday. And then if we got a negative result, then the kids could return, you know, this wow. coming Monday. So there wasn't even an option of, you know, kids who have had COVID already or who, you know, maybe they have been vaccinated recently and it's not time for them to get a booster. Um, it, they really have not communicated that, you know, any any apology or any um, concern for us as parents and the sudden let's just take your kids out for an entire week. Rachel, you uh, you told me when we spoke earlier and this was the chatter that was going on on social media and so several other people have sent this in as well that it's it's most likely a, a teacher that had it, and I'm not trying to call anyone out here or anything, but has the school uh, kind of said, hey, here's where the exposure was, or if they leave all that information for those? I guess what I'm getting at is they have, do they have privacy concerns for that person, but then not privacy concerns yeah, for calling out respect. vaccinated versus unvaccinated? Have they given you any details as to this potential uh, uh, exposure? That, yeah, other than that 813 email, we have had zero connection with the school telling us or explaining anything that happened um the chatter at the school is that it was a teacher and um when my husband went to pick up our son that was kind of the chatter but i don't know that that's official i i don't want to uh say that yeah. but um yeah there's been no communication about the extent of the exposure um how severe you know it was it's just been get your kid out of here, uh, you know, someone tested positive. So the school isn't communicating with you any better than they communicate with Jeff in the show when he asks them questions. They're keeping everything secret and not justifying any of this behavior that that singled out students for that kind of treatment. That's terrible. Yes, yeah, and I we, agree. And, Rachel, we sent a litany of questions, Olivia and I, to the principal. And as of, air, as of coming on at 406, we have not heard anything as of yet. Uh, Olivia? Um, are you going to stay at the school? And if you're not, what are you going to do? No, we are not. And we're going to do homeschooling. Okay. How do you feel about that? Good for you. I never dreamed that I would actually want to do homeschooling. <laughs> but yeah, now you no, do. I do want to do homeschooling. Yeah, I can understand that. I think a lot of kids can. I mean, there's so many homeschoolers this year and a lot of kids that dropped out from that school. A lot of schools. And was this like the the final straw? Like you said, uh, Micah, you were like, hey, I could never have imagined this, but now I'm I'm just, I'm happy to be doing this because of uh, what I presume may have been other issues as well, perhaps with the school. I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but I, we've, yeah. we, we went there. This, yeah, this was by far not the first incident we've had. This was just the, the icing on the cake that was the final straw. Yeah, okay. So, oh, Rachel, the, the leadership of the school, um, you know, there's a principal and there's the staff there, but there's also a board of directors, and, and the school is run as a corporation, so the board of directors are in charge. Is anybody holding anyone accountable for anything there? Because it sounds like a lot of bad decisions are being made. A lot of those decisions are adversely, significantly adversely affecting kids. Um, who's being held accountable for this stuff? Um. So we have, um, my husband has actually attended a few of the board meetings just as an observer, not, not as a participant necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but it feels like there is a very small majority of, not small majority, but a small amount of, of people that happen to be on the board who have very opinionated feelings on that's all the same side and no one else has a voice. They don't even... Right in my opinion, listen to the other side on just about anything. And even when we have communicated, uh, you know, with the board um, on various topics, not just COVID, but other issues that we've had, um, it's pretty much you're just kind of blown over and, you know, it's, you know, shrugged under the rug and 
assess it. There's not been any real action taken and no care on their part to show that they actually are listening to parents that might have a different opinion than, you know, the few board members who are allowed their voice. Well, Rachel and, and, uh, they, you probably have their ear right now. We shall see. But you may also have some people at statewide, uh, mm-hmm. some folks in, down at the legislature. Who, who knows? Um, it, what would you say if you, if you had their ear right now? I mean, final thoughts. To that board of directors. Yeah, yeah. or to, to people higher up at the state level. And you're like, hey, this is, this is a serious issue. COVID has definitely taken us all by surprise and we are all trying to figure out, you know, how we're going to exist with this. I don't think this is going away. Uh, but the sad part is, is it's affecting our kids' education and severely affecting it. Um, it's affecting their mental and emotional state and our reaction of constant fear and not focusing on what's best for our kids and their education um, it shows, and it's it's having a very negative impact on this generation. Um, and I would love to see us get to a solution where our kids are actually being educated and not just going from classroom to classroom and standing outside for long periods of time so that they're not exposing other people. Um, I want to see actual education happening in our schools again, and I don't feel like that is happening. Yeah, it's not, and you can see it in scores and uh, even – Governor Ducey, for all the disagreements I have with him over the past year, he mentioned, uh, you know, we need to focus more on math and not masks and things like that. And yeah. it's just been yeah. huge. Okay. That's very Rachel, well said, Rachel. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Micah, good luck, uh, with homeschooling. I think you'll be real happy. And then you guys can take the time to figure out what the next stage is. And, and we wish you the absolute best. Thanks for taking the time. Thank, thank you. you. All right, uh, the amazing stuff there, folks. And uh, please share that interview. It's up at talkwithjeff.com. And, and a lot of credit to Olivia. She did most of the uh, legwork on that one and, and, and getting the folks to talk and everything. So uh, thank you to Olivia. She's getting really good at this stuff. So share that interview. Go to talkwithjeff.com. Sponsor this segment of the show is the Blind Brothers. And when you call the Blind Brothers for blind shutters or shades, you're going to work directly with them. And uh, there are three decades of combined experience and never – uh, with subcontractors. They're going to lay out all your options, not just the most expensive ones to, to fit your style and your budget. And right now, my listeners get half off installation in addition to any other advertised specials. Just mention when you call them that you heard it here on the show. Do your neighbors a favor, call the Blind Brothers. And yes, they are brothers. Call the Blind Brothers at 928 634 2423. That's 928 634 2423. Call the Blind Brothers 928 634 2423. Or you can go to theblindbrothers.com. More to come next hour. If you're checking out, I, I get it, but I hope you'll stick around. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. We're also doing video. Go to talkwithjeff.com and uh, subscribe and share. I really appreciate that. Go to talkwithjeff.com. All right, hang tight. Back in just a few minutes.